Welcome to the Three Martini Lunch. Grab a stool next to Greg Corumbus of Radio America and Jim Garrity of National Review. Three Martinis coming up. Really glad you're with us for the Wednesday edition of the Three Martini Lunch. Jim Garrity on vacation this week. Rob Long is here in his stead. Rob, of course, contributing editor at National Review Online, co-host of the Glop Podcast, co-founder of Ricochet, and host of Martini Shot. And so, Rob, good, bad, and crazy martinis once again today. Let's start with the good. And anytime the courts are smacking down a big government overreach, we're going to cheer. And so that's what we get to do today with a little bit of help from uh, CBS News. Uh, Federal Judge Terry Dowdy is uh, how I I, I think we say that last name. Uh, He's a district court judge in Louisiana, and he has just shot down uh, President Biden's executive order suspending the issuance of gas and oil leases. And it's an order that actually applies nationwide. Here's what the CBS report says. Uh, The Biden administration's suspension of new oil and gas leases on federal land and water was blocked Tuesday by a federal judge in Louisiana who ordered that plans continue for lease sales that were uh, delayed for the Gulf of Mexico and Alaska waters and all eligible onshore properties. Uh, The decision is a blow to President Biden's efforts to rapidly transition the nation away from fossil fuels and thereby stave off the worst effects of climate change, including catastrophic droughts, floods, and wildfires. So basically, CBS is blaming the judge for any any uh, catastrophic weather events that happen, <laughs> yeah, right. not you know for upholding yeah. the rule of law. So good work there, CBS. Uh, Judge Terry Dowdy's ruling came in a lawsuit filed in March by Louisiana Republican Attorney General Jeff Landry and officials in 12 other states. Dowdy said his ruling applies nationwide and grants a preliminary injunction, uh, technically a halt to the suspension pending further arguments on the merits of the case. Obviously, it'll go up the the, up the system. Uh, here's the money quote, though, Rob. Quote, the omission of any rational explanation in canceling the lease sales and in enacting the pause results in this court ruling that plaintiff states also have a substantial likelihood of success on the merits of this claim. So it's not enough to just say, I don't think you're going to win. It's you don't even have a rational explanation for why you're doing <laughs> yeah. this other than that you want to make your uh, really loud and really rich environmental friends happy. Yeah, it's like you're not only are you wrong, but you're also nuts, uh, which I, I looked, I, I, you know, I am as we speak. I'm sitting right now in New Orleans, in Louisiana. Um, I've been here for about a month. I'm here for another week. Uh, I love it here. I think I may have seen that. I don't I used to have the federal court district. Uh, the, this, the district was used to be based here in New Orleans in the French Quarter. I may have seen that judge at a boozy lunch or two that I've had. Um, but in this case, he is 100 percent correct. And also. Uh, you know, he he makes it. A, 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 I don't know if he's making this point, but the argument that these leases somehow in ha, have somehow increased the if you believe in climate change, they've made it worse is demonstrably false. Leases on federal lands have led to natural gas and shale oil, which and and, and made has made America uh, energy independent, and has reduced uh, carbon emissions. That is absolutely incontrovertible. If you if worried about climate change and worried about fossil fuels, this is the way – natural gas is the way out. Um, <laughs> it just seems like it's bizarre. We're, half the time we're told to believe the science and half the time we're told to believe these crackpot environmentalists. But what's, I mean, what, I, I, what, what, is the, what is shocking, it, it, it actually it bears it, – it, I think it, it bears reminding people. The federal government owns almost 30 percent of all land in the United States. And in Louisiana, it owns about 6%. The federal government owns 6% of Louisiana. So th- these aren't just small things and small areas of jurisdiction for federal government and for federal bureaucrats. This is an enormous amount of power that is devolved has, or has been stolen by Washington, D.C. And there is zero, absolutely nothing in the Constitution that would suggest that this is okay. So this judge, even if he he could be driving around in a Prius and waving whatever, you know, the climate change flag all he wants, he's got the same constitution we do. And it doesn't seem like the federal government is allowed to treat the state's lands this way. And I suspect that, you know, there'll be some kind of compromise here. Um, but on the other hand, it, it is useful for us to remember that, my God, the federal government owns a third. If you, a third of every acre, a third of every acre in America. That's crazy. No, it is crazy. And uh, 
one of the other things we want to point out here, this is good for multiple reasons. First of all, it's the right decision legally. Second, it's the best decision for energy policy. And, and Rob, uh, the horse is probably too far out of the barn at this point, but it's also a great reminder that policy and law is not supposed to be set by executive orders and the administrative state full of unelected bureaucrats. That's really the job of legislators, but too often legislators are deferring to presidents and uh, bureaucracies of their own party uh, to make tough decisions or unpopular decisions so they don't have to take tough votes. I think it's really true, but I also think that there's probably some of that going along, uh, going on in the Biden administration. Uh, this is sort of a slapdash kind of silly rule they decided to do. They couldn't. It, it's a, it, it's hard for me to believe that they are that incompetent or that un, unused to the levers of government. I mean, you know, whether you agree with them or don't agree with them, that these are these are creatures of government. And it seemed like a lot of time. It seemed like to me that part of that judge's slapdown is, you know, you got to come back and come up with some reasons. You just can't do this. Now, meanwhile, the Biden administration can say, listen, we tried, we tried, but look, the big bad judges and all these conservatives got to vote for us in the midterms. They can make that argument. Um, but I suspect that our people, there are pro-energy Democrats. I mean, I, I know it's hard to believe. They're, they're not all crazy. Some of them, are, they're pro-energy ones. And some of them must have known that in states like Louisiana, where this is a very important issue, and in the idea of, cli- uh, of energy independence in general, you can't really do this. Um, and so they they had it both ways. They got to make a lot of noise and accomplish nothing. And in that case, they are sort of classic environmentalists, in my view, which is they make a lot of noise and they accomplish nothing. <laughs> um, but in this case, I believe accomplishing nothing was at least a partial strategy. I, I'll, I'll be interested to see what they come back to, um, because right now they have they've 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 quieted their the radical environmentalist uh, faction of the Democratic Party. By taking some stupid action, and they, and that action has been enjoined. So in a way, it's a win-win for the Biden administration. They get to um, be pro-energy, and they also get to silence the crackpots. Um, maybe that's just too cynical. Uh, maybe that's cynical. That's too, probably too cynical. Maybe they're just dumb. <laughs> It's like Occam's razor, like we were talking about yesterday at the <laughs> Wuhan lab. Just go with the right. simplest, most obvious explanation. But yeah, I mean, uh, there's a lot of challenges, obviously, for uh, businesses these days, whether you're in the energy sector or anywhere else. Uh, the pandemic has certainly put uh, its share of challenges uh, in your lap. And uh, government regulation and stupid rules uh, certainly don't make your life easier. But you know what else can be a big problem? HR issues can really damage your business. You can deal with wrongful termination suits, minimum wage requirements, labor regulations, and a whole lot more. And HR manager salaries are not cheap. Uh, On average, they run you about $70,000 per year. But there is help. It's called Bambi, spelled B-A-M-B-E-E, and it was created specifically to solve HR problems for your small business. Right now, you can get a dedicated HR manager, craft HR policy, maintain your compliance, and all for just $99 a month. With Bambi, you can change HR from your biggest liability to your biggest strength. Your dedicated HR manager is available by phone, email, or real-time chat. From onboarding to terminations, they customize your policies to fit your business and help you manage your employees day-to-day, all for just $99 a month. Month to month, no hidden fees, cancel any time. Of course, you didn't start your business because you wanted to spend time on HR compliance. I mean, <laughs> who would want to do that? <laughs> so let Bambi help get your free HR audit today. Yeah, unless your business is HR compliance, then yes, you uh, do want to spend time on that. But uh, other folks do not. And so Bambi is a great asset to have in dealing with those issues. Go to Bambi.com slash martini right now to schedule your free HR audit. That's Bambi.com slash martini. That's spelled BAM to the B-E-E dot com slash martini. All right, Rob, let's go to kind of a double-fisted bad martini here. And uh, we're going to start with what I think is the more serious uh, issue for the uh, Biden foreign policy. This is from Adam Credo over at uh, the Free Beacon. This is bad. The Biden administration is prepared to lift sanctions on the Iranian regime's primary vehicles for terrorism financing, according to the ranking Republican on the Senate Committee on Banking, Housing and Urban Affairs, which is investigating Treasury Department efforts to waive these crippling measures. Pennsylvania Senator Pat Toomey, whose committee has jurisdiction over the Treasury Department, is demanding the Biden administration turn over internal documents related to its impending decision to dismantle the toughest sanctions campaign 
in U.S. history. Toomey suspects the administration will lift sanctions on Iran's central bank and its national oil company, both of which were sanctioned by the Trump administration for acting as the primary funders of Tehran's global terrorism operation. As negotiations with Iran and Vienna continue this week, Toomey and other leading Republicans are stepping up efforts to block the Biden administration from granting Iran billions of dollars in sanctions relief. So, Rob, Biden, of course, is trying to resurrect the Iran nuclear deal. He sees this as a critical yeah. success of the Obama-Biden uh, administration. And so, um, and of course, anything Trump did, you have to reverse. That seems to be the main policy of the Biden administration here. But uh, anytime you're uh, setting up your administration for a headline that says Biden administration prepared to lift sanctions on Iran's top terrorism financers, you might want to <laughs> rethink what you're doing here. Well, I mean, I, I'm just baffled by the Iran policy, especially coming now. You know, it's interesting. I, I, uh, I have a long memory. I remember one of the first debates among the Republican candidates for the 2016 nomination. And the uh, person, uh, whoever it was, the reporter said to them, the question was, uh, uh, how many people on the dais right now will immediately repeal the Iran deal uh, when they become president? And everybody raised their hand except one, and that was Donald Trump. And so, you know, Mr. Trump, why would you do that? He said, I don't know. I want to read it first. Can I read it first? You know, read it. We'll figure it out. You know, let me read it. Um, you know, he's used to like making re renegotiating deals. And uh, a lot of people kind of rolled their eyes. And But the truth was, he got in there and he kind of looked at it and he said, forget it. Let's, let's get out of this. And he was operating with an old diplomatic uh, system, which we all know, which is the carrot and the stick. And it seems to me that the Biden administration has reinvented that. It's now the carrot and the carrot cake. There's really kind of no lose situation for Iran. Um, they announced early on that they were going to try to begin renegotiating with with Iran. Iran then decided, well, that's a, that's a good that's good news. We'll reward that uh, acquiescence by uh, encouraging Hamas to attack Israel, which they did um, only a couple of weeks ago. And everyone knows, including Joe Biden and including Kamala Harris and including the Secretary of State, everyone knows that those missiles launched at Israel, our ally were bought and paid for by Iran, Iranian money and with Iranian guidance. And the idea that we're within, a, I, mean, I don't know, was it 10 days ago, seven days ago, um, not that long ago, within within a, a few short weeks, if, if at most, we are now signaling to Iran that they are going to be rewarded for that just seems rudderless, as if there's no actual end goal in sight. Um, and that is a very worrisome thing in normal policy, but it's incredibly dangerous when you're dealing with a true international sponsor of terrorism. Um, and I just, to me, I just, like, it's one thing when you say to somebody, okay, I see what you're going for. I would, I would do it a different way. I understand your strategy. I think it's wrong, but I understand the goal. The goal here seems to be, I don't know, it, it doesn't seem to be in the service of a philosophy that makes Americans and its allies safer. And I find that very, very weird and troubling. And kind of hard to understand from a from a foreign policy apparatus that let's face it is you know a lot of the old faces we've seen before um i expected more than this level of incompetence and rudderlessness from um an old hand like joe biden well we're six years out from the uh the iran deal agreement the joint comprehensive plan of action as it's right. officially known and the fact that uh, our partisan lines are so fiercely drawn now that virtually no one who supported it in 2015 can even admit now that it was a bad deal and to the contrary uh it's a massive urgent priority to get back to where we were where you know we couldn't inspect military sites and we had all sorts of other uh restrictions and uh at best, slightly delaying the Iranian nuclear program as opposed to actually getting it dismantled. But the question well, now, of yeah, course, go ahead. it could be a, a, a possible strategy, which I would I would, it would be sort of interesting is to say to, the, to Iran, we're not interested. We, we're no longer um, participating in this. We no longer care. We're, we're not it's not one of our priorities. So we're simply going to let this languish. And any issues with Iran and Iran's compliance or lack of compliance or Iran's mischief or lack of mischief in the world, we're going to leave that to our friends in Israel. Um, that seems like a very interesting leverage point to make to Iran is to say, well, no, we're no longer going to tell Israel to stand back. We're going to let them do whatever they want. Um, I, if, I was, if I were the Iranians, I'd be running back to Vienna to try to talk to us, give us whatever we wanted, save us from the Israelis, because the Israelis are say whatever you like about them. They are not ambiguous. You know exactly where they stand. 
Um, and that is their great strength. And that is uh, right now our incredible manifest weakness. And uh, speaking of weakness, there's uh, more questions about uh, President Biden as he continues this uh, overseas trip. Uh, various comments where he either seemed to stray off into <laughs> other topics or kind of lose track in general. Uh, has, we've seen that at the G7. I think it happened in Brussels. He's now currently in Geneva. Apparently the uh, first meeting just wrapped up as we're recording this between him and Putin. Uh, but here's here's what made headlines before the, the, the first meeting uh, uh, broke up. Uh, it says uh, New York Post here. President Biden on Wednesday called Russia a great power and appeared to nod when he asked was asked if he trusts Russian President Vladimir Putin, sending the White House into damage control amid a chaotic introduction to the leader's high-stakes meeting. The nod from Biden happened as U.S. reporters and Russian security got into a near brawl in front of him in Geneva. The shoving match drowned out most of Biden's opening remarks and appeared to confuse the 46th president as he sat near Putin. Biden seemed to put Russia on equal footing with the U.S., saying in barely audible remarks, were two great powers before nodding after a reporter asked if he trusts the Russian leader. White House Communications Director Kate Bedingfield promptly tweeted a cleanup. Quote, it was a chaotic scrum with reporters shouting over each other. Biden was clearly not responding to any one question, but nodding in acknowledgement to the press generally. He just said two days ago in his presser, verify then trust. So... I'm not sure that gives me more confidence in him with that cleanup statement, Rob. But uh, that tells you tells you how much handholding this president seems to need. That a simple nod sends his press team into convulsions. Yeah, especially. I mean, you know, the problem is that we, you know, we've all been at Thanksgiving dinner or something, or sitting in the living room with you know an elderly relative, and they something happens and they smile and nod, and you realize, oh, they have no idea what's going on. This is what you this is a coping mechanism is to smile and nod um, when you have really no idea what someone just said. It could be the most shocking family revelation ever. And the oldest person in the room who's got the hearing aid turned down or really has tuned out, tuned out a couple of years ago. Nobody noticed. Uh, it's just sort of smiling and nodding. That's that happens a lot. We've all experienced that. The, the strangest thing to me, the two strange things, one is like the, the, the which I think is the crux, the problem with the Biden administration right now is that the phrase uh, verify, then trust. That is either a very kind of sophisticated and clever little reference to Reagan's constant rejoinder to Gorbachev, which is an old Russian proverb, trust then but verify, right. in which Biden seems to be saying in a kind of a very – not a way that, that, that Putin could, could not misunderstand, we no longer trust you. you know, we are, we are, we've taken one step back as, a, as two countries. Um, or he could just have gotten it wrong. Um, and if you're Putin, you could say to yourself, I don't I think that old guy just got it wrong. He just flipped it in his head. Um, <laughs> but again, which is not again, the ambiguity and the confusion of what it really means is uh, kind of perfectly emblematic of the of the problem that the Biden administration has. And the second thing is just the weird, crazy recklessness and the the the, the pointlessness of having a summit with Putin at all. If anything, Putin should be if, – if, if Biden believes what he has said, which is that Putin is a killer, Putin is in, has, has, has a directed interference in American um, energy, uh, you know, the pi energy pipelines and elections and all sorts of things, um, then surely you don't reward him with a fancy hotel stay in Geneva. You, you, you keep him at arm's length. And you, you punish him and you make him make some concessions and make him ask to come to the meeting. Um, the, the pointlessness right now and the rudderlessness of this administration's foreign policy, just it's just baffling to me because I just expected – I didn't expect them to be correct or to do, it, to, to do it right, but I expected them to be professional. And this is just kind of a clown show. It is. Although I think my favorite part of that is uh, even though that uh, I think it was the Russian security and the media are basically uh, brawling over here, Biden just doesn't even stop his comments. He just, he just keeps going. It's like yeah. it's, it's unclear he heard it. It's like he's at the Thanksgiving table and the two cousins are screaming about gay marriage and the old person's at the other end just kind of smiling and nodding because he's not there. Wow. Well, that is that is truly disturbing if that's the case. And uh, well. 
Wow. I'm, not, I'm not saying it is. Full disclosure. I don't know. Well, uh, like we say sometimes, maybe you just need a nap. And uh, hopefully he brought a my pillow with him <laughs> right. to Geneva. I don't nice. know if he did or not, but uh, if he does, if he did bring a, a my pillow, he can get a great night's rest on it. His head and his shoulders and his neck will feel great the next morning. Mine certainly do. And now you can refresh the pillows of every room because the premium my pillow is at its lowest price ever. Right now, for a limited time, you can get a queen size premium my pillow for only twenty nine ninety eight. King pillows are just five bucks more. And these are premium pillows. They never go flat. They give you the best night's sleep every night. They're made in the United States. And you get a 60-day money-back guarantee and a one-year limited warranty. And that's an amazing, amazing thing for a pillow. Go to MyPillow.com and click on the radio listener's square. Then enter the promo code MARTINI or call 800-874-0104 and use the code there. While you're there, take advantage of the deep discounts on all MyPillow products, including the Giza Dream bed sheets and the new My Slippers. Get your premium MyPillow today for just $29.98, but you can only do it with our promo code MARTINI. So call 800-874-0104 or visit MyPillow.com today. All right, Rob, let's go to our crazy martini now. Although, over the past year, this has become more common. It's still crazy, but it's become more common. And shockingly, uh, authoritarian-minded governors who were granted emergency powers don't want to give them up. Today's case study is California Governor Gavin Newsom. It's a state you have some significant familiarity yes. with, a former California resident. Uh, this is the Washington Examiner. Even though Californians will be able to fill stadiums, concert venues, bars, and restaurants, Governor Gavin Newsom says the COVID-19 pandemic is not over. Newsom signed orders rescinding mask mandates, business restrictions, and the tiered reopening phases that ebbed and flowed with infection and hospitalization rates beginning Tuesday. The state's Beyond the Blueprint does not include Newsom relinquishing his emergency powers, which were bestowed to him by a declaration signed in March 2020 and repeatedly renewed since. Quote, the emergency remains in effect after June 15th, Newsom said at a news conference. We're still in a state of emergency. This disease has not been extinguished. It's not managed. It's not taking the summer months off. And so, Rob, uh, the numbers are down far enough that pretty much everything is open. And I'm sure some places in California will um, let you in, perhaps based on your vaccination status. I don't know, but it uh, looks like uh, they're ready to have the places fill up anyway. Uh, but Gavin Newsom, uh, not going to wait around and maybe ask for some powers if things really flare back up. Nope, just going to hang on to him as long as I want. No, this thing, let's, I mean, I'm going to call it, okay, this thing is over. The free market and big pharma saved us. And guys like Newsom can't stand it. People are taking off their masks and they're going outside and they can't stand it. There was something about the crisis and the apocalyptic nature of the COVID-19 experience that we all had that just some people really loved. And I don't know why, but you know, you go into certain, I'm, I'm here in New Orleans, there's two, two different kinds of establishments, the kinds that you go into when you get your coffee and everyone's wearing a mask and they have a mask sign and you're still wearing masks and very mask centered. And then there's some that are like, eh, whatever, right? Whatever, it's all over. And you know, you can tell something about the kind of people who are working and owning those establishments. And they're the people who, kind of liked it that we all had to be inside all the time and they kind of liked the fact that we could go here and there and that suddenly the curfew was 11 they kind of liked it that the government was saying you have to stay inside and of course the government the bureaucrats and, and 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 progressives like gavin newsom love it because secretly that's th their problem they believe that every single problem that we face today would be solved if you just had less freedom and that is a kind of a weird, perverse psychology. But now that people are sort of, it turns out people like their freedom, these guys can't give it up. You'd think that Governor Newsom facing this sort of recall effort and, a, you know, plunging popularity would be the first person to say, no, you know what, go enjoy, enjoy your summer, go have a barbecue, get, get your shot and then you're done. But instead, he just can't give it up. He likes it too much. He's enjoying this. And I think that has been revealed for everyone, not just Newsom, but Governor Cuomo, those sort of restricted. They, they love they've loved this and they just don't want to give it up. It's their 
you know, it was their party time. They were in charge of everything. And now you want to take your take your power back? Forget it. Forget it. That would be frightening enough. But Jim and I just did a story on a poll a couple of weeks ago where Newsom's popularity is back on the rise now. It was down pretty right. far, which led to you know them getting enough signatures to let the recall go forward. But his overall approval is north of 50 percent, and his handling of the pandemic was even better. It might have even been close to two-thirds approval. I mean, I know California is kind of a lost cause politically for conservatives, but you would think that uh, just some basic common sense going back to Judge Dowdy in the first in the first there's no rational basis for it but uh, nonetheless um, yeah the authoritarian minded governors like it but apparently a decent chunk of the people do too and that I think is even more terrifying well that should be that that, that should be not surprising though I mean now, people talk about freedom all they want but what they really mean is uh, I like to be able to do what I want to do I'm not crazy about the fact that you can do whatever you want to do you know, even the <laughs> pilgrims when they came here the, the story we tell is that they came here so they could have religious freedom. That's not true. They came here because they couldn't impose their religious restrictions on people back in Europe. So they had to go to a new place where they could create a, a country that's entirely under their thumb. So it, it is a human impulse to try to control other people. What's weird about this, I guess what's not really weird about this, is that, is that, that we made some gigantic errors during the pandemic. And... Uh, and in, in the case of, of Governor Cuomo in New York, it cost lives. Mismanagement cost lives. There was a massive, if you live in New York City, you know, you live in, certainly if you live in, in, in Los Angeles, I used to, a massive sort of three-tier, three-layer cake of incompetence and mendacity from the local, state, and federal government. I mean, and I mean the chief executives of all those things were a disaster and the bureaucrats and all those things were a disaster. Uh, and there's this kind of, I think there's this denial and this wish on the part of a lot of people, probably a lot of people who, who are self-described conservatives, to just move on. Let's just not look at it. Let's just move quickly past this era and not learn from it. And then there's some like, you know, irritating, uh, incredibly nuisance conservatives or right wingers of some description like me and you who are like, wait, 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 wait. Let's just let's give me the TikTok on how we got where we got. And I think there's a lot of I mean, it's just natural. People just don't really want to relive it. Uh, they just want to move past it. Um, and you'd think that people like Gavin Newsom and, Mark, and Andrew Cuomo would understand that and want to quickly move past it, too. Um, in the face of Gavin Newsom, I just think it was just too intoxicating to be the big boss. And, you know, look, he's, I, I, you know, I don't think he was ever really in trouble. Um, with his uh, with the recall effort, but you know if you're if you're Gavin Newsom, you're looking at your poll numbers as you mentioned, you got to feel like you dodged a bullet. And there's nobody more reckless and bold than the guy who successfully dodged the bullet. Um, and so he's not going to give up this power. If, 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 if you know, if, if, if Gavin Newsom could, we, uh, every California resident would be forced to wear a mask. Uh, you know, every other Tuesday, just because he wants to have them do that. And it, 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 it and it's incredibly incredibly gratifying if you're the boss to make people do stuff that's you know that's what the alpha dog does and in a dog pack the alpha dog will stand up and cross over to a sleeping beta dog and just kind of give it a nudge make it move for no reason other than just to reassert its authority and that is exactly what's happening wow that is truly discouraging, but I do want to go off on a, <laughs> Sorry. on a high note here. And Rob, uh, the past three days have been a whole lot of fun. I only found out today you were actually doing all this from New Orleans. So uh, enjoy yeah. the jazz and the uh, beignets, and I'll talk to you sometime soon. Well, yeah, you'll have to. You don't, but whatever you do in New Orleans, New Orleans, don't try to talk to me after lunch. <laughs> um, and you know, you can interpret that as you will. <laughs> Rob Long is the contributing editor for National Review Online. He's the co-host of the Glop Podcast. He's the host of Martini Shot. And he's the co-founder of Ricochet. I'm Greg Corumbus of Radio America. Thanks so much for listening to the Three Martini Lunch today. Please subscribe and tell your friends about us. Also, we thank you very much for your five-star ratings and your kind reviews. Remember to get us on those home devices. All you have to say is play Three Martini Lunch Podcast, and it will play for you. Follow us on Twitter, at Jim Garrity. I'm at Dateline underscore DC. And Rob is at RCBL. Have a great Wednesday, and please join us on Thursday for the next Three Martini Lunch. 
Hi, it's Dana Lash, host of The Dana Show. Every day, I'm here to keep you up to speed on the most important stories and info that you need to know in your very busy life. And if you're always on the go and you want to stay connected, just download our daily podcast and take it with you. It's a great way to get up to speed on what you need to know and what legacy media may not be telling you. Visit DanaRadio.com and click on the podcast link or subscribe at iTunes, Spotify, or wherever you get your favorite podcasts.